GTP. That's a great transformation plan. Well, they've put before the Ghanaian people, the public, for consideration. Which one persuades you so far? That's the conversation that we're having tonight. Share your thoughts as always. Now, it was all fun and games when Ghana hosted the 13th Africa Games earlier in March this year. But the aftermath has been full of controversy. But now pressure is swelling for the expenditure to be probed. Some $245 million reportedly spent on this Africa Games. The special prosecutor has been petitioned. Stay with us. We have a conversation on this matter tonight on the Manifesto Check. We are in your election command center. We explore the jobs agenda in the manifestos of both the NPP and the NDC, promising and making jobs one of, in fact, a pivotal aspect of their manifestos. What are they saying in there? What are the similarities? What are the differences in the approach to creating jobs? in this economy beyond 2024. Stay with us here on the Oil Election Command Center as always. We have this including more on the disruptions of water supply. We're getting so many messages from you, our viewers. in some areas in Kanda here, Legon, uh, Medina, there's an environment that has been a disruption in water supply. We're getting to the Ghana Water Company, get some results and information for you here on Ghana Tonight. So always your integral part of it. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Minister for Food and Agriculture Brian Champon has justified the proposed 8 billion CD budget to alleviate impact of the drought. He explains that it is geared at compensating farmers for the crop losses and important food items to prevent shortages across the country. We estimated about $268 million that is required to buy inputs. If you put that together, $268 million is more than three billion. So the actual amount required is way more than eight billion. And the reason is this, you can't, we cannot fully compensate the farmers for all their investment loss. Forensic scientists from the Ghana National Fire Service have begun investigations into the cause of fire at Job 600. All activities in the Parliamentary Office building at Parliament House was brought to a halt because of the fire outbreak. The outbreak occurred around 9.45 a.m., compelling staff and members of Parliament to rush out of their offices to the open space between the administration block and the Job 600. It took three tenders and firemen about an hour and a half to douse the fire. Fortunately, we have stations around to cover the place, so uh, there's no uh, problem. I should not go. We have uh, better, you know, appliances. Um, government, fortunately, government uh, procured us two hydraulic platforms. That can even go to the 16th to 17th floor. So we have hydraulic platform, but because we are in the second floor. We didn't need any hydraulic platform or ten table ladder here. Coco Board, in collaboration with National Security, has intercepted a fuel tanker with some 178 bags of smuggled cocoa beans, valued at over 360,000 cities. The intention by the three arrested persons was to smuggle the beans to neighboring country Togo. Even if you have sufficient money, you cannot be fined by a court. Even if the judge wants to help you, his hands are tight. He cannot do it. And so anybody who wants to buy cocoa should rather come to Cocoa Board, apply to Cocoa Board, and go through the process. Otherwise, your cocoa will be confiscated, you'll be prosecuted and sentenced, and then your truck or whatever you are using may be forfeited to the state. <music> The Santa Hino Two for Say to Do has destroyed the Jase Hene, Bemu Hene, and Achiame Hene of Sabronum for superintending over illegal mining locally referred to as Galamse. 
This was after the overlord of the Asante mine conducted a thorough investigation and found the chiefs guilty. You've been asked to take care of the community, but you failed because of your selfish interest. Women in your community are struggling to get potable water. Effective today, you've been disturbed. The Electoral Commission's voter exhibition exercise has come to an end, recording low numbers across the country. The turnout of the voter exhibition exercise was less than impressive, raising concerns about possible voter apathy and the implications for future elections. The factors that brought more low turnout are the code that have been used for people to check their names, uh, two, the publicity that would say it's not much. And three, the people's attitude towards the election because they say whether, whether they do it and vote, nothing good comes out of it. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, so far, how far? Have these manifesto promises convinced you? The MPP, the NDC, Movement for Change, the, how are these manifestos resonating with you, the people, the eligible voters out there? And what exactly is in there for you? Now, we, we started teasing out the various aspects of the manifesto yesterday, or the manifestos of the two major political parties, and indeed, uh, also the Movement for Change, GTP, as we serialize them in the coming days. You saw the establishment that we, we put out there yesterday in the education sector, a number of the policies that they have promised that both the MPP and the NDC, similar in nature, but then again, the end objective, the execution process is what is different. Dennis Barberi Wadam put it out there. Today, we're gonna to focus on jobs. It's gonna be joining me shortly, but both the MPP and the NDC launched their manifestos and also the campaigns have been running in full swing over the period. While the NDC flag bearer John Mahama is in the Greater Accra region, the MPP's flag bearer and Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Obamia is currently in Techiman in the Bonois region doing some community engagement as, as well there. The NDC is making a case for what they call a reset. The MPP is making a case for what they call an upgrade. The Movement for Change is talking about the Great Transformational Plan, GTP. But then again, We've been engaging members of the general public as to how all of these plans are resonating with you. Take a look. I think yesterday I heard the vice president, that's Baumia, and uh, according to his engagement with the, the media, I found out that uh, he has a solution for uh, our end unemployment. And then as a whole, the, the problem in the whole country. Now I you know the whole world is now moving faster to digital. So I think if we give him that note, uh, the Ghanaian youth also can have some jobs from that sector. The day the NDC was uh, launching their manifesto, I was at Vunora, so I was not able to uh, listen to them properly. For the past eight years now, um, I haven't seen what MPP has done that how I can now count that. So this is what um, Nanado has done. That I can, I can, I can actually what point at, but um, if I, if I would say uh, when EDC was on, was what was in power, like I, I can point to so, so many hospitals and schools that what he has built before what he has lived the city for years now. You know, the MPP has been criticised of at least poor leadership in terms of governance. But when you yesterday, after listening to you, I think that I'm I'm beginning to have a change of mind. I mean, I've not been following their staff, but. The, what I have heard that I can say that maybe I'm related with is the uh, manifesto of the, the the NDC flag bearer. I like the 24 economy. I mean, system.
and I have more of this on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. And, and when you look at the key voter concerns and voter issues uh, that, that the likes of Global Info Analytics have, have been doing across the 16 regions, if the respondents have identified these three key issues as the major issues that are going to influence their choice on who to vote for. Take a look at this. We have economy, jobs, education. These are the three major issues. The others follow in that order. And then you have roads, you have healthcare, but for the top three issues that will, would be of key concern and consideration to voters going into election 2024, you have education, jobs, economy. Yesterday we showed you the education policies of the MPP and the NDC and the similarities in there. When you look at the various manifestos, the GTP, the NPP's manifesto and the NDC's manifesto, you have jobs mentioned in there for, the, for uh, about 74 times for the NDC the manifestos of about 162 pages, the jobs mentioned there 74 times, economy is mentioned there 88 times, education is mentioned there 156 times. And that is in the 162 page document of the NDC. If you look at the MPP's 260 page manifesto, jobs mentioned in there 172 times, economy is mentioned in there 73 times, education is mentioned in there 156 times. Look at the Movement for Change, GTP, jobs. In fact, this is a 77-page document. It's the smallest of the manifestos that have been launched so far. Jobs, 31 times mentioned. Economy, 33 times. Education mentioned, 39 times. So it's clear that they know and they understand the concerns of the people captured in their manifesto. But then again, the promises made to address these issues, how... Is it resonating with you, the Ghanaian people? So we, we went on to social media. If you go on our Facebook page and our X page, 3news.com, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, it's running right now. You're going to see it and you can contribute to it. The question that we ask is, which political party do you trust to deliver on their manifesto promises? Because as I indicated, all of them have promises to address their three key issues, jobs, education, and also the economy. But which of them do you trust to deliver? 2,350 of you took part in this poll, which is running. 15% of you say you trust the NPP and their manifesto promises to address these three key issues. 66% of you say you trust the NDC to deliver on their promises to address these three issues of jobs, education, and the economy. Movement for change, 4% of you. And guess what? New force movement. Nana Kwame Bediako's New Force Movement comes in there. 15% of you, that's over 3,500, 2,300 of you who uh, took part in this poll indicated that you trust the New Force Movement, even though they haven't launched their manifesto yet, saying that you trust them to deliver on these. But then again, you see in there, 66% of you are talking about the NDC and then also the MPP flowing in that order. If you go on our three news GH page on X, we have some 356 of you who took part in it. And then look at our WhatsApp page as well. In our WhatsApp page, you have 631 of you who responded saying, yes, you trust the NDC deliver on their promises. And 31 of you say NPP. And 22 of you say movement for change and new force movement. 46 of you say so. So that's a reflection on how things really look like right now. So beyond this poll, we want to have a conversation with one person who understands this and has been watching the space quite closely, and especially the concerns that a lot of you have been sharing with us. Dr. John Osai Kwapon is a political analyst and a Democracy and Development Fellow at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD. Dr. Kwapon, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. This is the result of the poll, the reflection and of the sentiments and the reactions of the people about the manifesto promises that the political parties have made to them so far. It now boils down to the trust. The key element in all of this right now is the element of trust, is it not? Who is trustworthy? You are correct. Uh, both parties have presented their manifestos. Both of them are promising and proposing ideas across all sectors of the economy. Uh, they are proposing to do all manner of things in education, in health, in agriculture, job creation, fighting corruption, um, and all of that. And 
there are a lot of similarities. There are some key differences as, as well. But at the end of the day, they are both demonstrating or at least trying to tell the Ghanaian voter that we understand the challenges that you're facing and these are the things that we can do to help you or to help address those challenges. And when all is said and done, that is what it is going to boil down to. That as voters think about all of these proposed ideas, uh, which they see regularly um, as part of elections, every election year, uh, these parties come up with very comprehensive uh, manifestos and promise a lot of things to voters. It will boil down to which of these candidates can I trust to deliver on what it is that they, they are promising to do in all of these um, areas that they have touched on in their manifestos. Right. And, and you see, uh, Dr. Kabon, the incumbent, as in this case, Dr. Mahmoud Bami and indeed the NPP, is going into this election with this 80-year cycle of the incumbency fatigue, you know, that, that atmosphere of change already blowing in that because of the 80-year cycle we have seen since 1992. But then again, they are determined to break the eight. Now, the former president, the flag bearer of the NDC, is also coming in for the second time to seek re-election as president of the Republic of Ghana, and then also putting out their policies as we have seen. Reset or upgrade? From your own analysis of the current climate, political climate, going into this election, just a little over 100 days to this election, Will it be, or is it favoring a, the pendulum? Is it favoring a, a reset or an upgrade from what you're seeing? So all of the indicators would suggest that this should be a turnover election, right? Uh, if you think of the cycles that we've been going through since 1992, every party gets eight years. Yes, former President John Mahama got four years of his term in office, but his party had had eight years at the end of uh, 2016. So we've been going through eight year cycles. In addition to the eight year cycles, we are going into an election where we are coming off the back of some challenging um, economic times. Uh, the, the ruling party would even admit that there's been some challenges. Yes, they prefer, they, they, they give their own reasons as to, or they give reasons as to why we face those challenges. But on the back of the eight year cycles we've been given political parties, plus the, the, the challenges that have been experienced over the last couple of years, everything would suggest that this is an election that would result in a turnover or in the way the NDC is putting it, that would result uh, in, a, in, a, in a reset. But there's also something, I don't want to say odd, but there's something interesting that I am observing about this election. The MPP is actually campaigning as though they are an opposition party, but at the same time is also exhibiting quite a lot um, of confidence, which makes me feel as though they sense an opportunity to be able to convince Ghanaians that we don't need a reset, or as and as Baumia will put it, uh, we need we need an upgrade. If you look at the recent the the last poll that came from Global Info Analytics, even though it still showed John Mahama as the likely winner of the election, you also do see some lost ground. Um, for, for him, and you see some decline in support. Um, so it's making the election dynamics quite interesting. And the way it's been framed um, even makes it more interesting for the Ghanaian voter in terms of, do you want to go with a reset agenda, a reset agenda or do you want to go with an upgrade agenda? Mm. For me, ultimately, it's we are facing some some challenges, social, economic, some governance challenges as well. The parties have put out ideas, and it is up to the Ghanaian voter to make their way and, through and, all and of these proposals and ideas 
and go back to the first question that you ask. And it is that point about going back to the first question and then you outlining the challenges the Ghanaian people are faced with, the realities we're faced with right now. There was a time in our political history where that message of Shewa Sitin Monatuaba, look at your conditions of living and let that dictate your decision to vote. Do you see that kind of messaging having any prominence or impact going into this election? I, I, I definitely do see elements of that where voters would give consideration um, to that famous statement, you know, Shewa, Shewa Sitnemuna Fatuaba. Fatuaba. So there will be that element of the consideration of the issues. But I think it's also a political reality that every political party has a strong base of support they can always count on, whether in good times or in bad times, they can always count on a core group of supporters to vote for them. So I think that's where the parties would both be starting off from a base of right. support. The question of where the, the, the fight for the votes would come from would be those uh, 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 independents, neutrals, undecided, people who may even be dissatisfied with the ruling party and are considering switching over, people crossing over as well from the other side. That is, that is the middle where that position, sorry, where the election would, right. uh, would be decided. But overall, I also believe that uh, the Ghanaian voter generally is sensitive to, uh, to the issues, um, are not just prone to sloganeering anymore that really they think of their economic situation, they think of their economic circumstances, um, and vote based on those economic circumstances, those living uh, conditions, and make informed choices as to uh, which party they want to, to go with. I mean, they could still be feeling the pinch in their pockets, but still choose to go with the uh, incumbent. That's a, that's a possible outcome that they will still trust that the incumbent can get them out of it. And then there are others who would look at the pinch they're feeling in their pockets and think, I want to try somebody else uh, right. because I believe and trust that they are in a better position to be able to uh, help me deal with the pinch that I'm feeling in my pocket. Right. Dr. Osai Kwapong, appreciate your time on this matter. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Dr. Osai Kwapong is a Development and Democracy Fellow at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD. This is Ghana tonight. This is your Election Command Center. Coming up next is Manifesto Check. Well, on Manifesto Check tonight, as we started yesterday, pointing out to you the similar policies in the education sector in both the MPP and the NDC manifestos. Now, we're moving to the next sector because we outlined to you the three major issues to the Ghanaian voter as sampled in the polls across all 16 regions by Global Info Analytics, education, jobs, and the economy. We did education yesterday. Today, we're on to jobs, is it not, Dennis? Right, rightly so. It does appear that the political parties are following keenly what the polls are indeed saying. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at what they have on the face of the record, and I say the face of the record, I mean on the face of the manifestos, you would, have, you would see that there's a focus on jobs. And that's exactly what the polls tell us. That's one of the key things that voters are going to look out for in the election will be jobs. For instance, when you take the MPP manifesto, the title is Selfless Leadership bold solutions for jobs and business. Mm -hmm. So you find the emphasis on jobs. Likewise, the NDC manifesto, they have resetting Ghana, jobs, accountability, and prosperity. So mm -hmm. clearly on the face of it, you'd notice that jobs play a significant part of the manifestos. Indeed, the MPP, even before the launch of the manifesto, had hinted that 80% of the manifesto was dedicated to job creation. When you That's read right. parts of the NDC manifesto, the part that talks about um, jobs, they tell you that their topmost priority is job creation. So that mm. is in no doubt. Super. For some reason, I don't know whether it's coincidence or whatever, when you check pages 19 of both the MPP and the NDC manifestos, 
all on the same page. They're talking about job creation. Page 19. Yes. Interesting. But I mean, there's a lot on job creation, mm -hmm. but we just decided to handpick a few things that will serve as the common denominators. For, some, for each party, they have other things that they are going to do uniquely by way of creating jobs. Right. For instance, the NDC with their famous 24-hour economy, you wouldn't find that in the MPP manifesto. True. So we are just looking at what is common amongst them, some of them. Now, the other thing too that runs common is jobs in respect of the digital sector. Mm. So when you look at that part, the MPP is promising to train 1 million youth in digital skills. Right. For them, they are pretty straightforward. That's what they are saying. The NDC also says that they have a 1 million program for coders. In explaining that, they say that they will train 1 million young Ghanaians who will be trained in digital skills such as coding. They have web app um, development, digital engineering and all that. Right. Who will take up jobs in the digital space. Okay. They put this or pitch this as job creation. Mm -hmm. But we see it to be people who are trained in digital skills. There are many who are asking. The mere fact that you are trained to acquire a skill, does that necessarily transmit into creating a job for the person? Those right. are questions that will be put into, I mean, the, the people who put this together and how these one million people, indeed, if they get the skill, will transform into jobs. Because, of course, there are people who have skills and they are still working around without jobs. Right. Now, the other thing that also runs common has to do with also in the same space of the digital economy. MPP says that they are going to establish a fintech fund with a seed capital of 100 million US dollars. That's the equivalent of 1.6 billion Ghana cities. Exchange rate here is um, a dollar is to 16 cities. That's so how it's see it is. currently 16 cities, is it not? Yes, so that, okay. this is their own number. That's not mine. That's in, in, in the manifesto. The um, NDC says that they are establishing a fintech um, growth yes. fund. Seed capital is 50 million dollars. And that is to promote growth in the, of digital entrepreneurs, and that ultimately will lead to job creation. Mm -hmm. So you find this as a common denominator in the manifestos of the two parties. Again, when you come to the security services, the MPP is pretty straightforward. They say that they will employ more security service personnel. Of course, they've already made the case of how many they are employing. So it's only fair for them to say that they will continue to do so, so they'll employ more. Now, NDC says that they're going to undertake a critical public sector recruitment based on a comparative human resource analysis gap. This stems from the fact that, I mean, this is hinged on their 24-hour economy. Right. Already, we have heard the flag bearer, John Ramani Mahama, indicate that, for instance, when the 24-hour economy begins to run, a major component will be security, for which reason we would need roughly 25,000 security personnel to run that project. Mm -hmm. So you would find that captured under this, but it's not stated expressly as you would find it stated in the MPP manifesto. But of course, it's recruitment under the security services. Again, there's also a promise in both manifestos for the M and MPP to establish a women's trade empowerment fund, WUTEF, right. to support women owned businesses. This they believe will empower women and also create jobs. Hmm. The NDC the most touted women's development bank this also comes in as a woman a women empowerment tool but of course the ultimate objective is to be able to empower women to have successful businesses which will in turn employ employ other people so this is women focus yes policies. in this particular one then again when you come to infrastructure development now the mpp wants to create jobs through private sector construction and infrastructure development and others. The NDC says that when they roll out their big push for rapid infrastructure development, the focus will be for job creation. Now, this also begins to give us an idea the kind of jobs that are to be expected. Because not all the jobs will be white color jobs. That's right. Because in the construction sector, you'd find that there are different layers or categories of workers who will be in there. So when we think about job, I think when we begin to read the manifesto in, its, um, in between the lines, we see that the jobs that are promised here will not exactly be the same kind of jobs. So largely, these are some of the things that run through the 
manifestos with respect to job creation. Mm. Interesting. And the, the, the outlier you see there is the process yeah. of how they intend to achieve the end objective. Yes. And you see that also pointed out in this one million. When this one million jobs, that's the training, the digital skills conversation came up, the NDC made reference to the 2020 manifesto because I know it's something that you looked into as well. Yes. That this was captured in the 2020 Precisely manifesto. Precisely so. And it's new in the NPP manifesto with the mm -hmm. one million as well. But then again, you see the focus on the digital space and the and, and the advantages in there. Yeah. Running through all the all the job. I mean, both creation. both parties recognize that we now live in an era of uh, it's a digital era, so they cannot do without it. So absolutely. By and large, they are trying to train more people in that space. Mm -hmm. But their thinking is that by training or giving people this particular skill, and now when you go back and look at the data that you have seen here, mm -hmm. the one that talks about it. When you look at people within the ages of 18 and 24, yeah. for them, their major problem is jobs. True. That's, that's the orange. Yes, uh, that's the orange line here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. 25 to 34, when you look at them two, they are, the job it's, it's, it's is so significant. That's right. Yes. So mm -hmm. what it means is that, and these are the people who fall within the digital economy mm -hmm. or those who can understand what happens in that space, for which reason when you give them the skill, it is their world. True. So it only, it's only fair that that particular group is targeted. But the question still remains, if they have the skill, does that automatically translate into a job? That's a question that needs to be answered. Accept. But of course, this is what the manifesto say, and mm -hmm. in the coming days, we'll dig deeper and deeper to find answers to all of these things. And certainly so. Dennis, appreciate you, as always. Thank you so much for joining us. And tomorrow, the third sector and the third issue of concern to the voters, as we have seen in the polls across all the 16 regions, is the economy. We'll find out what exactly is presented in there. But coming up next, pressure is mounting for an investigation into Ghana's expenditure at the Africa Games, the 13th Africa Games. The details coming up shortly. But earlier today, there was a, a group petitioned the Special Prosecutor's Office um, to investigate Ghana's expenditure at the 13th Africa Games. The petition by the Forum for Accountability Ghana wants the OSP to look into concerns raised over transparency, accountability, and also the value for money in the use of public funds. Kwame Osu Danson is president of this forum. Take a listen to him. We'll, we'll recall that shortly and, and tell you exactly uh, what, what, what exactly they're asking of from the special prosecutor and why we should all be concerned in, in that. But some $245 million is what is reported to have been spent on this Africa Games. And there are fundamental questions about exactly what has to be done to be able to get some level of accountability going into it, especially when we're told also that some... $15 million was spent on feeding these athletes within this 18-day period. Let's take a listen to Kwame Danso. Every Ghanaian citizen is interested in accountability. And I want to believe that the office was set up for the purposes of ensuring expeditious accountability. And so I would not want to give them any ultimatum. But I know that they have the interest of the good people at heart and they must do what is right by the, their conscience, and they must do what is right by the laws of this country. Um, to that end, I expect that they get back to us uh, as soon as possible so that we can be assured that they are interested in investigating this matter and bringing finality to it. I am very confident in the Office of the Special Prosecution. I think that we have a plethora of examples to cite about the competencies of the Office of the Special Prosecution and also the commitment and the patriotism demonstrated by the uh, Special Prosecutor himself, Kisia Jabin. Um, because we do know that the Special Prosecutor was appointed by this government, but has been very instrumental in investigating matters of corruption in this particular ad administration. To this end, I'm very confident, highly so, that the Office of the Special Prosecution will discharge its... Well, so that's Kwame Danso there. Now, this follows what has been happening at the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament. In fact, last week when someone at a George, member of Parliament for the Negro Pram constituency, asked the question of the sports minister, and then that opened this Pandora's box of 
how much exactly was paid GBC. Now we've gotten to know the details of it. Not not just three companies, but five companies were engaged to you know to do all of the other aspects of the of, of the coverage of this Africa Games. But then again, this two hundred and forty five million dollars that we're told is the total expenditure spent on this, according to the sports minister, sometime in March, there was some one hundred and forty five million dollars that was spent in the construction of the state of the art center at Boteman. $145 million was spent on that Boteman Sports Center. And they spent $34 million, according to the Sports Minister, on renovating the University of Ghana Stadium. Also, $16 million was spent on the refurbishment of the Games Village. This Games Village is it's not a new village that was built, from what we do know. These were hostels at the University of Ghana Lagon, which were according to the words of the sports minister, refurbished. They, they installed air conditions in there, painted the, the hostels, and then they put these athletes in there with some new beds and so on. $16 million. That's how much it cost. And we'll come to that. Keep that in mind, right? And then the coverage, $3.6 million. Feeding of the athletes, according to the ranking on the sports, select committee on sports in parliament, Governor Wyoming. It says $50 million was spent on feeding the 5,000 athletes over the 18-day period. And then accreditation for coverage and so on, all these athletes and all, all the officials in there also cost $4.5 million. That's how much, right? All of this. And that's raised some fundamental questions about exactly how these monies were spent and whether there's value for money in there and whether these monies were judiciously used. Remember, this is your money as well, and you should be concerned how these were, were used over the period. And so we asked the question, and what is on your screen right now is a tweet by a journalist who's going to be joining us shortly, Sadiq Adams. Sadiq Adams posted on his X page. He says, UPSA is literally constructing an entirely new school campus, a 10-floor multipurpose Twin Tower edifice and the two new story hostel block facility. Now, he puts these facilities by UPSA, the two story hostels, 10 story each, will accommodate 3,250 students. All four grand projects cost $230 million. That's about 230 million CDs, I beg your pardon. That's $40 million. So he, he then puts it together and try to juxtapose this cost, and this is what is on the screen right now, these two grand projects by UPSA costing $40 million as against the refurbishment of an existing hostel at the University of Ghana costing $16 million. And Sadiq Adams is joining us. Call him Sadiq Obama. Good evening, Sadiq. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. It's always a pleasure, Alfred. You ask what I would describe as a common sense question, because if what you're saying is anything to go by, that these two grand projects we're, we're seeing on the screen, constructed by the UPSA, is costing $40 million. New buildings, as against the refurbishment of existing hostels for, this, for these games, costing us $60 million. What's the disconnect there for you? You are in this poor sector. Right, thank you very much. So I have seen the expenditure of the African game just as you have run through uh, a short while ago. And what I believe is that the blankets announcements or mentioning of these figures will not do justice to what the people understand. Basically, if you say $18 million for, or $15 million for feeding uh, 3,000 athletes over a 20 day period, uh, how many meals were cooked. So to properly put it in a context for people to understand it, uh, you just have to understand, go deeper to know how many meals were cooked per day as compared to the Olympic Games. Generally, how many meals were cooked? So this is how I'm trying to situate the conversation so that the ordinary man, the layman on the street can understand what these figures mean. So the University of Ghana referred refurbishments for all the games that we have attended normally the game village is constructed and normally around the main uh, stadium that's hosting the event so when we attend this game the game village is put up sometimes a fresh um, put up from stats so the construction will start alongside the stadium or near to the stadium but 
what happened with the African Games is that we are refurbishing four already existing hostels at the University of Ghana campus, so Kwapon, Elizabeth Say, and the others, which are quite closer. And the refurbishment will come as a result of the fact that the hostels were constructed to accommodate students. So when you want to put in athletes, you need to put in some bit of facelift, a new bed that can accommodate or contain two persons in a room, air conditions in each room, a water heater, you have to paint it, maybe there will be a bit of electrical works to do and, and plumbing works and painting. So these are the most significant. I have been there and these are the most significant uh, refurbishment um, in terms of quantities that were done to the facility. And you see to it that refurbishing a facility that is not too old. So you look at what was invested in these facilities. They were not broken down. They were facilities that were existing and not too dilapidated in a sense. So you do not need to pull down the roofs or the walls or anything. Just decorate the rooms and raise the status, maybe with some bit of tiles that are broken. So, so if that refurbishment is costing the Ghanaian taxpayer, the Ghanaian taxpayer, 15 million or $16 million, properly $16 million, how will people understand what has been invested? I put the UPSC one because I am trying to understand what $16 million can do. And I see the UPSC construction of an entire uh, campus. So they are moving the general staffing, administrative uh, quarters of UPS to a new one that is ultra-modern. And that is inclusive of um, elevators, state-of-the-art complex, with two hostels accommodating over 3,300 3, students. And the cost of that is $40 million. They are starting from a fresh ground zero to a facility that is new. And these two facilities are happening alongside, I mean, around the same time, 2021, 2022. So they are still on, on the construction of the UPSC one, 95% done as I understand. So I put this to a technical person and ask, if $40 million can construct a hostel or a rooms that are more than the hostels on the campus of University of Ghana, why do we refurbish four hostels to the tune of 16 million? And mind you, these UPSC hostels and accommodation blocks have almost all these facilities that were imputed in the ones at the uh, University of Ghana. So air conditions are there, uh, lecture rooms definitely with air conditions and state-of-the-art facilities with screens and elevators. So if you do that and you, you, you put that side by side with how much we invested in refurbishing four hostels that were already existing, then you understand what the figure means. So we refurbished four hostels for $16 million to host an event of 18 days. And UPSA is constructing an entirely new one, four grand apartments, 10 story each for 40 million, 2 million difference. Refurbishment and starting construction of this grand project in the same I mean, environment, UPSA is just closer to Legon. So we could have constructed um, four new hostels, better than what is at University of Ghana. Far, far better, in fact, and with $40 million. But we refurbished hostels, $16 million. When construction of four better hostels, or tramodding ones, mm. cost right. less. And that's, it's a, that's how I, I just want people to understand. And, 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 and it's look, it, it's, a, it's a good analysis because it brings home um, this whole uh, conversation about what the monies could have been used for judiciously while we exactly. await the further breakdown. Because you make the point about all of these huge figures being put out there without giving us the full details of exactly. Because until last week, we didn't know the full breakdown of the $3.6 million dollars that was used for the coverage, correct? And until then, uh, you, you, yeah. you, you had yes. the GBC Director General also coming in and then Sports Ministry releasing statements here and there. Because if you look at the $50 million that has been reported to have been spent on feeding these 5,000 athletes, if you do the quick mathematics, over this 18-day period, you divide the $15 million by 5,000 athletes over a 15-day uh, that's 18-day period, you're spending a little over 2,650 thereabout a day 
on each yes. other. That raises questions, is it not? Unfortunately, we, 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 we lost Sadek there um, and, and that connection. But it, it, look, it, these are issues that bring up a lot of more matters. And Sadek, I was asking about the, the quick maths with the feeding. It also has its own questions, is it not? Yes. Yes. So w w with uh, regards to the feeding, uh, we have done some checks and gone to the highest or top put cell in town and uh, spoken to them on the cost of feeding. So you take, for instance, um, the top hotel in this country, their breakfast, lunch, and, 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 and dinner put together, their buffet, how much will it cost to feed the number of people? And uh, entirely, we have gotten around, um, I mean, we even added 1 million for fruits and other stuff, and it was around 4.5 million for 25 days, uh, this same number of athletes. So we had to even add 1,000 more athletes to the one we have for miscellaneous or other uh, people who will come to uh, the, the dining hall to take meals outside of the athletes. So we had 5,500 athletes put it to the hotel in town and say, for instance, if Kempiski is supposed to feed 5,500 athletes with um, their buffet, which is the highest, how much will it cost for 25 days? Even though it was for 18 days, we extended to a further one week and say people have stayed. And it was around... 4.5 million dollars so you would need a breakdown for paris olympic games for instance they have stated that they are they are going to prepare four million meals four four million four million different meals because you have mm -hmm. 208 countries attending the paris olympic games so you have four million meals and they prepare four thousand meals different meals a day these are the breakdowns you need so if you require or there is an a probe into the African Games expenditure, and you call the person in charge of feeding and say, how many meals did you cook per day? Then they will be able to explain better how much went into feeding breakfast, lunch, and what was in the breakfast. Then you can speak to the athletes. Some of them are from Ghana. Some are from Nigeria that we have spoken to. Is it, is it really uh, true that you were fed with these meals as have been stated at the probe. So right. this is better than by putting right. the blanket amounts. We would want a probe so that right. we know the details of all the expenditure. It's a very important question in there. The special prosecutor has been petitioned as well. So we'll see how things play out. But Sarik, as always, it's good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, getting into some information from, from you, our viewers, what interruption and water supply in some areas, and uh, we monitored to take a look at this. These are the areas that we've got a number of you um, calling out from Dodo, Aoyibi, Frafraha, Denta, Madina, Ashongmang, Hachola, Osu, Kanda. All of these places, we have a number of you calling us, um, indicating that you are experiencing interruptions in water supply over the last 48 hours. And... The, also airport residential area Legon and surrounding community so what exactly is happening and Stanley Mante is joining us on zoom right now um, it's, it's 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 out of the jurisdiction but Stanley appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight what's leading to this interruption in water supply as we're getting from our viewers in all of these areas quite a number of them okay thank you very much um, for the opportunity um, we had a small challenge on one on our transmission line between Bong and, and Dodoa booster station. And that is how uh, we serve those living in the northeastern part um, of, of the metropolis. So um, I mean, it was something that we, we knew we could yes, just use some four to six hours to have it repaired. So this happened, this happened on, on uh, Sunday, 25th of August. And um, uh, we had to work uh, on, on that transmission line. So within six hours, we were done. Uh, but unfortunately, when we started production again, we realized that there uh, were some other challenges with the transmission line um, uh, along that same stretch. So we need to shut down again and to have uh, those ones also uh, repaired mm -hmm. as well. And that is how come uh, it's delayed a bit. As I speak to you, we are about 96% complete. And we are hopeful that by close of day, 
um, today will have the job completed and then we'll start uh, a treatment and production and supply again. Then, um, since uh, the lines have been depleted for the last um, 48 hours or so, right. um, we know most people may have depleted all their receptacles. So then it will take, um, let's say, some um, additional 24 hours to 48 hours to for the situation to, to, to settle within the metropolis. We will apologize to our consumers um, uh, on the current situation, um, but we are hopeful that by close of day tomorrow, which is um, Wednesday, okay. uh, water should get to every part of the metropolis. Oh, okay, so so I heard you say earlier that there's work ongoing by close of day today. The works will be completed. But then again, it's tomorrow that all things being equal, some of these areas will have their water supply restored, correct? We're going to complete the job today. Right. Um, but like I said, all the lines are depleted now. Uh, most people have depleted their rest receptacles. So it will take a bit of time for the lines to be charged when we start, when we resume um, supply. Okay. So we'll urge consumers to exercise some patience um, so that uh, at least by close of day tomorrow, we should see much improvement uh, within the areas um, affected. Uh, we are sorry for the inconvenience caused by uh, right. the situation. Uh, but we are on top of the situation and we are working uh, very hard to ensure uh, that the situation I, I, is brought back to normal. Okay. Zamante, before I let you go, I, I get the apology re repeated a number of times. But then again, the people who are watching right now are wondering, so between now and whichever time they get the water flowing through their taps, what should they do? Um, we we'll urge everybody uh, who has some water already at home especially because we've been encouraging people to store water. We know people have um, water in their receptacles. And so we we'll urge them to use um, the little water that they have um, uh, wisely they can manage it effectively so that at least it can take them for the next 24 um, hours or more um, um, until uh, we resume supply. But like I said, supply will resume immediately uh, the job is completed. Well, I'll uh, tell we you are what. stand by and we are hopeful that the job will be completed within the next few hours. We'll monitor that, but not everybody has receptacles and others to store water. That I can tell you for sure. But thank you for, for the information and then also the update as well, that within the next 24 hours, we should expect the situation resolved. We we'll would follow up on that and update our viewers as well. Chief Manager of Public Relations, Ghana Water Company Limited, Stanley Monte, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. My name is Alfred Okonse. Have a good night.